I, I, before I start, I'll just have to say one funny story about Doug McAdams. So this, this book that took us 22 years to write, he, um, his daughter, um, he told his daughter, you know, Neil and I are just finally publishing this book, and you weren't even alive when this started. And she, and she looks at him and she says, and you're proud of that? <laughs> but, but anyway, so uh, today I want to uh, uh, talk about um, a project that I'm currently working on with one of my graduate students named Jacob Habenick. And uh, has a, uh, I hope you like the title, Sucker Punched by the Invisible Hand. Um, there's, a, there's a book um, by a, a financial economist named Gary Gordon, which is uh, called Slapped in the Face by the Invisible Hand, and, uh, which is about the financial crisis. And I, and I think it wasn't just a slap in the face. I, I think it was actually a little stronger than that. Um, I think it, a, a sucker punch, um, which maybe that's an American term, but I'll go ahead and explain it. Um, is the idea that someone, when you're not looking, hits you as hard as they can, and usually you double up and you end up on the floor. And, um, and I think a sucker punch is, is, is closer to a way to think about what happened. So um, let, me, let me go on with that and say that what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do today is mostly uh, talk about empirical stuff, but I, though I realized from that really wonderful introduction that I'm, that I'm in, intensely basically giving the, have all of the theoretical stuff is gonna show up, but it's a little bit in the background. And um, the main motivation I want to give you is that um, there was this, uh, the, when the worldwide financial crisis began in 2007 and really spread around the world in 2008, it had sort of three things about it which I think are, are worth trying to explain. Um, the first one is, is that it started in the United States. Um, most of the financial crises that have happened in the post-war era started in other kinds of places than the United States. It spread mostly to the developed world and mostly to Europe and not the developing world. And it spread incredibly quickly. Um, I, I have here 12 months, but I would say that the crisis probably spread in, in less than three or four. And these are kind of the interesting facts of the crisis when we're talking about how it left the United States and went to the rest of the world that uh, we're going to try to explain today. That it started in the US, it basically affected Western Europe and the US, and it went so quickly. For the first time since the Great Depression, um, as all of you know, the most advanced industrial societies have gone down in this financial crisis. Um, in Europe, it's still going on in different kinds of ways, shape, or form, and I'll maybe say a couple things about that towards the end of my talk. So what are, the, what are our explanations for this? And most of our explanations for this come, come from, um, from economics, and they revolve around the idea of financial contagion. And um, the kind of stories that we have about this, there are three or four of them. I'm gonna tick them off for you really quickly in case you don't know them. The first one was is the reason the rest of the world went down like the United States is we all had this financial bubble that was created by rapid, rapid house price appreciation. So it was really that all of these other countries really looked like the United States in the, in the fact that from 2000 to 2006 or 2007 they had a housing bubble. When the US went down, they all went down. That's one of the stories. The second story we get out there is a story about uh, credit market deregulation, that credit markets have been deregulated. This made banks more, um, uh, risky, made them open more to um, having financial problems, and we'll see that there's a little bit of evidence for this in our data today. Um, the other kind of arguments that people make, um, uh, they talk about something called the flight to safety. Um, that is that what happens in a financial crisis is that uh, financial actors move their money into places, away from places they think are risky, and towards places they think aren't. Um, there are a couple other arguments that people make. Uh, uh, this was an argument that was made about why Germany had a recession, is that your economy was so dependent on exports that when the worldwide recession started, um, your economy got worse because your recession, your uh, exports went down. And finally, um, the one that, uh, that is floating around out there is that countries with high current account deficits were places where people wanted to get their money out of and into places that didn't. One of the great ironies of what happened is, is the United States, which was the center of the financial crisis, ended up being the place where all the capital flowed to. That was the place that it was safe into American Treasury bills, and we are currently still benefiting from that. But uh, I'm here to tell you that a lot of people have taken these explanations and put a bunch of data sets together and run a lot of data, um, and including the data that I'm going to show you today, um, and they haven't been able to find any econometric evidence for it. So while you may have heard about one of these explanations, or um, sometimes the press picks them up and acts as if they're true, this happens in the United States all the time, the fact is, is there isn't much support for any of these kind of contagion arguments. 
um, to explain these facts that I'm interested in. And today, instead, I'll offer you a different way to think about this, uh, a way that um, really uh, tries to think about the globalization of finance um, from a kind of sociology of markets perspective. And I'll show you how, in fact, um, the banks around the world, um, as I'll put it later in my talk, all became the same bank. Essentially, they were all acting the same, the largest banks in the world. And um, they came to suffer from this crisis in the, because they were all essentially exposed to it. And I'll now develop that argument a little bit for you. Um, the main thing that happened is that banks from around the world, just like American banks, um, got very deeply into buying mortgage-backed securities, um, which from now on will appear as MBS, and collateral debt obligations. And, um, and this wasn't just American banks, but this was banks across Western Europe. This explains the, one of my three facts, which is why um, the crisis occurred mostly in Western Europe, is because mainly the largest banks in the most developed societies were the ones who bought these products. The second thing that brought all these banks down is that the main way that they were financing this was using very, very short-term credit. And you've all probably heard or, uh, of the idea of something called shadow banking, and I'll talk a little bit about shadow banking in a little while. But essentially what the shadow banking market is, is a market where banks loan money to each other. And one of these markets is called the asset-backed corporate paper market. And in this market, banks loan each other money on a very short-term basis, sometimes as short as one day, 90 days, very rarely up to a year. What was happening was is that at the eve of the crisis, banks were buying long-term financial assets like mortgage-backed securities and credit default obligations, buying them with short-term debt. What happened was is as these mortgage-backed securities and CDOs um, began to lose their value as people started to get nervous about it, Banks had to provide more collateral, and they were unable to roll over their short-term loans, and they found themselves in this liquidity crisis, the one that we all know um, about now. This caused a systemic banking crisis in banks where, in countries where banks were active in these markets. And in essence, the fact that is that almost all the world's largest banks were doing this, and almost all the world's largest banks in the fall of 2008 were susceptible to the same pressure that the American banks were. And um, this, of course, was followed by a uh, rapid and steep recession in the advanced industrial world. So this is going to be my story. And the rest of my talk is going to excuse me, be an attempt uh, to try to convince you of it. Um, and as I was just saying, um, this wasn't just an American story, and I think this is the most interesting part about it. I, um, somebody was asking me yesterday about how long I've been working about, or today about how long I've been working on this, and I've been working on this for a long time, and it took me about three years to figure this out, and so I, I um, it's, 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 it's maybe, now it seems really obvious to me, maybe it'll seem really obvious to you, but I think when I started, I didn't realize that all of the banks around the world had, I knew that all the banks in America had joined in on this party, and um, by the time you get to 2007, essentially there's no difference between a commercial bank and an investment bank and a savings and loans bank in the United States. They're all the same bank. They're all doing the same thing. They're originating, securitizing, and buying and selling securities. They were all doing that at the end, which is why when the collapse came, they all went down so dramatically. What happened, I think, around the world was is that these securities were incredibly attractive because people made so much money off of them. And I think that banks, mostly in Western Europe, who didn't have a lot of other good investment opportunities, saw how much money the American banks were making, and they came into this market in droves. And um, what essentially happened was, is they followed the strategies of the American banks, who were also borrowing short to go long, and um, they got themselves um, um, uh, implicated in this in the same way the American banks did. In this case, uh, the way I think about this is, that um, essentially the way to think about the globalization of finance is that the core banks were using these financial instruments in a very similar way. They had a similar set of strategies and what um, I would call a conception of control if I was going to go into my more um, arcane technical language. Now I want to just say a little bit about theory. I mean, uh, there's a couple of ways to theorize about this and I, I'm going to just put a couple of them out on the table. I think, um, you know, in political economy, um, and the literature on financialization, 
um, there's kind of a, a set of arguments about how this globalization of finance works. And I think one of them is pretty straightforward, which is that um, investment opportunities for Western capitalism in the last 20, 25 years haven't been in the advanced industrial countries. What this has meant is that financial institutions have looked internationally for new ways to make money. And uh, if we go back about 25 years ago, I think scholars mostly thought that this money would flow to the developing world because there would be higher rates of return, more risk, higher rates of return. And as we know, for a while it did in the 90s, and, and um, uh, a lot of money flew, um, went into Asia. It also went into Latin America. Um, that didn't turn out very well for most banks. It chased them out of those markets. Um, but in the period after 2001, what's less well known is that the largest banks in the world that are not American discovered American mortgage-backed securities as that investment opportunity. And, um, as, and um, from what I can see is that if you, um, if you go back and look at the notes and minutes of the Federal Reserve, uh, one of the uh, things that they figured out in the summer of, um, of 2007 was this very peculiar thing, which is they had all thought that the money that was buying these securities was coming from China. And it turns out when somebody actually examined the flows, that wasn't true. That's another story which you've been told, maybe, is that the Chinese caused the American financial bubble. That's one of the stories that people like to tell. That turns out not to be true. What turns out to be true instead is that it was this money that was flowing mostly from Europe, and I'll show you a, 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 some data on that in a couple of minutes, that was really pushing this market along. And we'll, We'll see that in a second. And that surprised the people in the Federal Reserve. They didn't quite know what to make of it at the time. And of course, uh, the next year, the whole thing collapsed. But, but at, at the time, it was something that they were puzzling about, like well, what was going on? Now, as I'm saying is that I think the, that what happened was is that um, this was uh, you know, part of the search for profit investment after uh, the American stock market crashed in 2001. And American mortgage-backed securities and CDOs were highly rated instruments, mostly AAA rated, and I'll be happy to talk more about why that was later, with relatively high returns. Um, banks around the world flocked to these investments, particularly after 2001, when interest rates were low and they could borrow money at a very low rate, and I'll talk a little more about that in a second, too. And they had the funds to invest, and the returns were astronomically high. Let me just give you a little factoid, if you don't remember anything else about what I say today, maybe you'll remember this one, which is that um, the financial sector in the American economy accounted for 40% of all the profits in the American economy in 2003, with 8% of the employment and about 12% of GDP, 40%. It has consistently been over 30 um, in the last 10 years, and it went down, of course, in the crash in 2008, but it's come back. So it is the most productive and most profitable sector of the American economy. And the fact that banks around the world figured this out and saw it and wanted some of that action just kind of makes sense now that we understand this and have gone back and figured it out. The second um, kind of theoretical place where I'm coming from is um, the sociology of markets, which uh, Dave, so you, you, you summed it up so well. Uh, and uh, thinking about these as markets as fields. And, um, and I, I actually think this is one of those, uh, I, I mean, I, I think a lot about globalization in different kinds of ways, and I think a lot of sociologists have kind of really gotten into thinking about this in a sort of semi-mystical way, which is to see it as flows or something like that, or to, or to understand um, these things as about the financial instruments. By, and, and the reason this has come about, I think, is that people have gone and spent time looking at traders and seeing what traders are doing. But I think, um, I think if you like step back a little bit and really understand what these banks are doing and how these banks are actually really watching each other and are quite well aware of all of the things that are going on in the tactics and strategies, I think we can see that, that um, one of the untold stories here is how uh, banks around the world join um, the American banks in this particular project, the, the project of making money off of um, mortgage-backed securities and CDOs, mainly by borrowing short to go long. And, um, as members of that field, my argument basically is, is they were susceptible to the same downturn as their American counterparts. And the way to think about this is I've almost now totally accounted for the three facts I wanted to account for at the beginning. One, it starts in America. Two, it spreads to Europe. And three, it spreads really fast. And that's the reason it spreads so fast is that these banks were exactly susceptible to the same pressures as the American banks. And when Lehman Brothers went down because they, they uh, couldn't uh, raise money to pay off their, um, sh their debt, 
um, everybody started looking around and everybody had this commercial paper and everybody was sitting on a lot of these mortgage-backed securities and liquidity crisis kind of spread through the, not just America, but the whole world. And I'll talk a little bit about how the Federal Reserve reacted to that in a minute. So how did this work? How did people make money doing this? What is the conception of control, if I can go ahead and use my own language? Well, let me, um, as I said, that banks figured out that after 2001, um, interest rates around the world were relatively low. And um, uh, banks, um, there's, a, there's a market, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second, that banks could borrow money really, really cheaply, like 1% or 2%. And American mortgage-backed securities and CDO were paying returns of around 6 or 7%. And these, these uh, um, were by and large rated uh, AAA. And not to go too far into the arcaneness of uh, accounting standards, but, but um, one of the things that uh, the Basel Accords do is they make AAA rated uh, mortgage-backed securities something that you have to hold less capital against. And so these, these, these um, products had lots of really positive features for banks. They, they had to hold less capital against them. They had really high rates of return. They were really highly rated. When the banks went to their banking authorities who would look at their books, they'd go, oh, you're holding this stuff. It's AAA rated. OK, that's fine with us. So bank regulators around the world saw this stuff, and they didn't see, it didn't raise any red flags for them. It looked you know, completely normal. They would take this money they would borrow, though. Here's, here's the kind of great part of the story that I think is really interesting, which is less well known. And um, they, would, um, they would buy these bonds, and then they would use these bonds as collateral. And then what they would do is they would borrow money against them. They would then pay back on these short-term loans what they could, and they lived on the profit. So imagine, this is, this is a kind of a, 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 it's pretty amazing, right, that they were, they, were, they were essentially using other people's money to make 6 or 7%. If you take the 1 or 2% out, that means they were making 5 or 10%, 5 or 6%, excuse me, on, on essentially no in capital invested, right? And one of the reasons that banking was so profitable, and this is where the profits were in the American economy, is, is this is kind of the, you know, like anybody could have done this, and once people figured out how to do it, you were an idiot if you didn't. So it, you can just sort of see that, I think, as the market went up. Um, I want to say something about shadow banking. I'm not going to talk much about it today. This has been one of those topics that kind of gets thrown out there, and the press doesn't really understand uh, this topic very well. And, and um, this is, um, shadow banking refers to something that I think it's better known or called the interbank loan markets. And what happens is, is that um, a long time ago, banks and corporations um, decided that they, you know, they didn't want to sit on cash they had all the time. And so what they would do is um, they would, you know, want to loan it out to somebody for a short period of time and earn some interest on it and then be able to get that money back really quickly. And, and, um, and it worked both ways, that banks could be both borrowers and lenders in this uh, interbank market. Um, one of the, in the United States, this market actually started when the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913. And the main reason it existed was um, to help banks and um, corporations deal with the fact that when they were shipping goods overseas, they would often not get paid back for 90 to 120 days, and so people needed capital to float them on that. And you can see in a world like that, this kind of a market makes sense. It says, if I'm going to ship something to Germany, and I'm not going to get paid back for three or four months, I have a bill of lading here that says I'm going to. I can go into the market, and I can borrow money on that bill of lading for three or four months. It's going to cost me a little money. But then I can take that capital, and I can reinvest it. And this is a very sensible kind of way to think about it. By the time you get to um, the, um, the 70s, I mean, to the 80s, 90s, and, and now, um, this market grew very, very large. And, and, and there are several, there are actually three parts. There's something called the asset-backed um, commercial paper part. There's the repo market. I'm not going to go in and explain the details today. And, um, and then there are the money markets, which are, which are very large in the United States. Um, the one part of the market that I want to talk about today is called the asset-backed commercial paper market. And these are loans that are actually secured with assets, and they definitely have very, very short time horizons. When Lehman Brothers went down in, the sp in September of 2008, the basic problem they had was they had a lot of this short-term paper, and they couldn't pay it back. They had nothing they could turn into money really quickly to pay it back. And this is why they ended up going bankrupt, is because they had, a, they, had a, 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 uh, they had more than a liquidity crisis. So um, 
What happened was, is as I was saying, is when these investments, when things were going great, everybody made more money than God. Uh, but uh, when things uh, went bad, banks around the world faced the same problems as the US banks. They bought too many of these things, and they'd done so in this um, asset-backed commercial paper market. As the value of these CDOs fell, banks had to increase the collateral for these loans. One of the way these loans worked was that um, there was something called mark-to-market book, uh, bookkeeping, which meant that if these loans fell, you had to produce some collateral. Um, let me say something else about, uh, which is a very obscure thing, is, which is about the capital requirements for banks. Um, uh, a lot of the banks uh, were, you know, leveraged out, you know, like maybe 30, 40 times, which meant that they, the amount of capital they had to cover all of their debts was like 3%. And if you think about um, holding a bunch of debt and having to come up with a lot of money, 3% isn't very much, and you can quickly eat 3%, you know, really, really quickly. And so a lot of these banks were, got in trouble. When they got in trouble, they got in trouble really big, and then like that, they were gone overnight almost. Um, European banks had the same problem as American banks. Um, they weren't, uh, they uh, couldn't raise capital. They faced a liquidity crisis. And as you are now familiar with, uh, the governments um, all across the West um, bailed their banks out. Um, I come back to my point. My explanation explains the three facts I started with, why it happened so fast, why it spread to the European banks, and in essence, the largest banks in the world had become the same bank. They'd earned their largest profits the same way, borrowing short go long. So now, now comes the part, the skeptical part of the story. You say, okay, Flickstein, that was a really great story. And for 10 minutes, you know, you're going, ah, yeah, all right, that's got to all be, you know, who knows if this is true or not. So is this true? Is my story true? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, one of the problems is that um, getting information out of banks is a really, really tough thing to do. And banks uh, don't reveal information very readily. And, um, and even when banks are, have, are highly regulated, to actually understand, you don't really ever know what they're holding. So for example, the Federal Reserve um, publishes data on all the commercial banks in the United States. And if you ever go try to figure out what exactly are the investments these commercial banks are holding, it's impossible to do. It's just totally, completely impossible to do. So to go to the banks themselves and figure it out is really hard. So what we end up having to do a little bit is we got to be detectives. We got to go out there and look at all the circumstantial evidence and look around a little bit. And, um, and I think what you'll see is that um, if this is a mystery um, and this is a crime, then I think, we've, I think we've got the perpetrators of it. But you, this is for you to judge. So let me begin by the most important of my salient facts, which is um, who held all of this? Uh, mortgage-backed securities. This comes from a data source in the United States um, called Inside Mortgage Finance. If you ever see data on the American mortgage industry that has any level of detail, it came from this source. This is a private organization that actually gathers data from the banks. And so um, the, it's, it's quite an amazing thing. It's a proprietary database that you have to pay money for, but um, it's quite an amazing data set. So let me, uh, let me, uh, let me talk about this graph for a second. Um, what this graph shows is between 2002 and 2007, it shows the different um, kinds of investor groups. And uh, the one story, uh, which we can dismiss, another one of those fiction stories we can dismiss, is that Fannie and Freddie, which were the large government-sponsored enterprises in the United States, caused the crisis. As you can see, Fannie and Freddie, over this period, had more or less, that of the top line, the magenta one, had more or less stable holdings. In fact, they were going down a little bit. And the story that Fannie and Freddie caused the crisis is an urban myth in the United States, only believed by people who work at the American Enterprise Institute, as far as I can tell. And I think no economist believes this story. The other interesting lines in this story um, are the investment banks, which have, at the beginning, about 30 billion, and they go up to about 300 billion. Um, one of the things is this table has such a large scale on it that it, that line doesn't look like it goes. That's the black line at the bottom. But if you think about that, it's about a tenfold increase over this period. And here we're talking about the five large investment banks, Goldman Sachs, uh, Morgan Stanley, um, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and I'm leaving one out. That, um, that, that's where that is. The line for our talk that's the most important one is um, the, uh, where is it? Uh, the light blue line, which is, um, why is it not on the, oh my god, it's not on, oh, the foreign investors, it is in the table. And that one goes from about 200 billion in 2002 to about 1.2 trillion in 2007. 
So this means that foreign banks were net buyers of American mortgage-backed securities of a trillion dollars in this five-year period, net buyers, okay? And um, the other thing is, um, this was the period, um, I won't show you a table about this, but uh, I have it in another paper, um, which also comes from Inside Mortgage Finance. If we look at the non-conventional mortgage market in the United States, the so-called subprime market, this is the period where it greatly expanded. So most of these trillion dollars worth of, uh, more of uh, holdings are in subprime or non-conventional mortgages, as they like to call them. So what happened um, in uh, beginning in 2008, here's, now I'm gonna go to my detective evidence. So that I think is evidence that everybody has to believe that banks bought this stuff. And we haven't got to who bought it yet, but you gotta believe that foreign banks bought this stuff or non-American banks. Um, when the Federal Reserve uh, came into this in, in, this, in the fall of 2008, it, it, it's my opinion that, uh, that 20 years from now when somebody actually writes the history of this, Ben Bernanke will be the hero. He, he didn't get what was going on for a long time, but when he got it, he got it, really got it. And when he really got it, he realized that this wasn't just about American banks. It was about the entire world banking system. And he knew and the other central bankers knew that if they didn't provide massive liquidity to the world's banking system, the entire banking system was gonna collapse because everybody was implicated in it. So one of the little known things the Federal Reserve did is they bought $1.25 trillion of what are called agency -backed, mortgage backed securities, which are conventional mortgages. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to take a question about what that means later. Of the 14 banks who sold these securities back to the Federal Reserve, eight were foreign banks who sold back about two uh, about $666 billion worth. The American banks who sold, it reads like a who's who of the bad guys. Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Merrill Lynch, Mer Morgan Stanley, and, and obviously for some of those banks it didn't work out for them anyway. Who are the foreign banks? Now we actually have names, I can name some names. You can see some uh, Deutsche Bank who had a big crisis because of this, RBS, UBS, Barclays, BNP, Credit Suisse, we can see that uh, a lot of the big European banks were in this. Uh, the other thing that um, the Fed did was they opened up their short-term credit window. You can actually go out and get this data if you go to the Federal Reserve website and see what they did. Um, they loaned out um, uh, banks uh, to not just American banks, but any bank that had an office in the, uh, in the United States. So any foreign bank could come get it. There were about 156 foreign banks who took money out of this short-term credit window. You can, if you go look at their uh, names, you'll, they'll, you'll recognize a lot of them. 142 of those were European banks. This is kind of evidence that the Europeans uh, needed that money, that they were coming for liquidity to the Federal Reserve, not just to the uh, ECB um, or their national authorities. And um, um, you can see that there. So who, who held these MBS? Um, and this is a, a measure of mortgage-backed securities over um, GDP. And these are the countries where the highest were. And some of these are stories that people don't tell. When people talk about Iceland, they don't talk about the fact that Iceland, um, people, the banks in Iceland were holding massive amounts of American mortgage-backed securities. No one ever attributes that Iceland crisis to this, but the Iceland banks were involved in this is, uh, pretty deeply. The Irish banks, which of course were owned by the British, were involved in this deeply. You can see Belgium, France, Netherlands, Switzerland, Norway, United Kingdom, Germany. You can see that all of the people who kind of had a financial crisis in Europe were holding on to these. This is, this is some good evidence. Um, and in Asia, Japan. This comes from the Federal Reserve. If we go to the asset-backed commercial paper market, this data is, was painstakingly gathered by um, a couple of financial economists. It's, it may have appeared by now, I think, in the Journal of Finance. I can give you that reference if you're interested to it, in it. And what do you see if you look, read these names? Who was in this short-term paper market uh, as a percentage of GDP? And wow, it's the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, UK, France. You can sort of get the picture here. I think it's starting to come clear, hopefully. Um, there is not a complete overlap between these two lists. Eight of the 10 largest purchasers of mortgage-backed securities are not on the asset-backed commercial paper market. Eight of 10 is a pretty high percentage, but nonetheless. Eight of the 12 largest users of um, um, ABCP um, appear on this on the list of MBS, not Denmark, Spain, Australia, or Sweden. There's a high overlap here, but not um, a perfect correlation. And this is something we do know, which is the 25, uh, I think this is 25 largest foreign bank users of uh, the American asset-backed commercial paper market. And now I think we can get to the, to the I think if we're, if we're gonna find the suspects, here they are. Uh, 
ABM AMRO, HBOS, HSBC, Deutsche Bank, I mean, you know, Society General, if you know anything about the crisis, Rabobank, uh, um, one of the Londis banks which uh, went belly up, a couple of the Londis banks, Ing, which went belly up, um, Fortis, which went belly up, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that pretty clearly. So, um, and these were the American banks, the largest ones. And uh, again, we can see, um, let's see, um, Bank of America survived, Citigroup survived, they were too big to fail and, and the government forced them, of course, to eat a lot of the other ones. Bear Stearns is gone, GMAC was reorganized, State Street Corporation is gone, Lehman Brothers is gone, and Countrywide Financial is gone. So, you know, I think this is prima facie evidence for most of us that um, these banks um, were in this market, they were buying mortgage-backed securities, they were buying, um, they were using asset-backed commercial paper uh, to do this, but for many of us, we like to model stuff, and so we'd like to see something more quantitative and a little more um, um, convincing in a multivariate model. And today I'm just gonna talk a few minutes about um, the model that I, uh, that I, was, uh, that I estimated. And um, essentially what I wanna try to do is uh, just give you a feel for it. I'm not gonna like, uh, I, I have regression coefficients, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna put them up in front of a big audience, but I'll happy to do a question and answer. So here's the kind of basic ideas. There's these underlying conditions going on. We have the systemic banking crisis. Um, the conditions might be a cause of the recession. This is the sort of contagion theory. And um, the systemic banking crisis might be a cause of the recession. And so we're gonna try to model these two processes. First, the systemic banking crisis, and then second, the recession. They're really hard problems in doing this, and I will not underestimate them for you today, that um, establishing causality in this data is really difficult to do. The data was not collected or is impossible to collect in fine enough grain, and it isn't connected frequently enough, and it certainly isn't collected well enough at the bank level, so you end up having to use the countrywide levels for all of this stuff. Um, there are key constructs which we use all the time, which are really inherently vague, like, what is a banking crisis and when does a banking crisis begin? And, um, and, um, and I am, uh, what I do in the paper is we try to make some uh, decisions which allow us to try to separate in time uh, what we can. Um, I don't, you know, you can not be convinced by it, but the empirical demonstration is an empirical demonstration. Um, our basic story, though, is that the same exposure to the MBS CDO and the asset back commercial paper caused the financial crisis for everyone. Um, this wasn't really contagion, but it was in fact the fact that everybody was exposed to the same kind of risk. And this explains why it happened so quickly, is that if it was contagion, it would have to be the money over here moving over there, which undermined this, which then undermined that, and it would be a process that might unfold over, the, over a relatively long period of time. This didn't work out that way. This in fact moved much more quickly than that. So as I said, you have to make some compromises. Um, it's, you can't really do contagion. All you can do is try to separate things by variables that occur before 2007 and try to get them to th cause things that occur in 2008 to 2010. Um, we, uh, as I put here, we operationalize by similar conditions, meaning we looked at conditions that were previous in time and not coterminous. We actually remove a lot of the data we have because we can't tell, and so we're, we're working on the, uh, a smaller data set. So there's really two data sets that are country level data. We have 45 countries with data on all the independent variables. Um, actually, this is wrong. The 45, oh yeah, wait a second, this is right. That we have 45 countries where we have the housing price appreciation data. Turns out housing price appreciation isn't widely collected. It's very highly sensitive to how rich the country is. Um, and I can talk about that later if you want. I do have data on 77 countries with uh, data on independent variables, but no housing data. Let me just tell you a little bit about what a banking crisis is. Um, this is a measure that's uh, uh, in the literature, and there's five criteria to determine a banking crisis. Uh, banks are provided extensive liquidity. Banks required to significantly restructure. Governments engage in asset purchases. Governments provide significant guarantees on liabilities, and governments nationalize banks. Uh, countries with two or more of these conditions include the following. Um, and uh, again, I think you can see that the relationship between the countries that went down with the banking crisis 
And the other data I have is pretty strong, though they're obviously not perfect. There are, um, there are a set of control variables uh, in this analysis. Um, we have a change in housing prices from 2000 to 2006. We have the current account deficit as a percentage of GDP. We have exports over GDP. We have a measure of credit market deregulation, which is a commonly used measure in the literature. And uh, also as a control, we have GDP per capita. So when we run a model, we run this model on our data set um, with um, both 45 cases and 77 cases. And uh, we have a logit model for whether or not there's a banking crisis. And um, the other variables are measured in 2007, the MBS and the ABCP. And so it's whether or not there's a banking crisis in 2008 um, or 2009, which is now a dummy variable. And the only two things that come in the model are the um, whether or not a country has uh, a high level of asset-backed commercial paper and whether it has a high level of mortgage-backed securities. In essence, the other variables that uh, come from the contagion theories don't have any predictive ability on the banking crisis, and um, the crisis appears to be entirely the result of um, uh, banks' participation in these two markets in the United States. Um, when we run a regression on changing GDP in 2009 and 2010 um, with the same variables, um, what we see is that um, having a banking crisis um, lowers your GDP, not surprisingly, and um, having evidence of having uh, bank deregulation also lowers your GDP. So obviously, um, the banking crisis um, and the deregulations that occurred across uh, many countries um, play a role in the, in the recession. The other variables don't come in. Um, this is also very similar to the regressions that other people have run. And um, in fact, the, some of this data comes from uh, some of the other econometric uh, analyses that people have done. We just more or less confirm what they've confirmed, which is that it's not really about contagion. It's not really about the underlying conditions. It's really about having had this crisis. So this is all kind of sobering, I think. I find it kind of sobering. I, I, uh, um, I try to present it to you, obviously, in its strongest, most undiluted form. But um, let me go ahead and try to review it, and then for um, a few minutes, say some things um, in conclusions that we might take away from this particular understanding and what it might mean for subsequent research and what it also might mean for governments and regulators and people interested in all of this. Um, I would say that the worldwide financial crisis and the ensuing uh, recession um, pretty clearly had its roots in the American mortgage-backed securities market. And, um, and it was the integration of the worldwide banking system that brought them into this market and caused them to buy a trillion dollars worth of this stuff in five years, which was really mainly um, the main mechanism by which this occurred. Uh, banks all over the world bought MBS and CBO, and, they, and they, many of them participated in this asset-backed commercial paper market where they borrowed money to do this. Um, as I said, they increased their holdings from about $200 billion to about $1.25 trillion. Most of this was subprime mortgages. It's a little hard to break that out because that's not the way the government collects the statistics. I think you can infer it if you, if you go back and look at um, what happens between 2003 and 2007 is that um, the so-called non-conventional market, which is everything but prime mortgages in the United States, increases from about 30% uh, of the market to about 70% of the market. Um, and that's a whole story in and of itself, which I won't tell, but if somebody wants to ask me a question, I can explain that to them. Um, when these subprime, what happened in these subprime markets, the reason that made many of them so susceptible to downturns is that a lot of the people who bought these mortgages bought something called an adjustable rate mortgage. Do they have those in Germany? No? Do you guys have adjustable rate mortgages? I don't know. You don't? Yes, you do. Okay. So, so people know what that means. Uh, an adjustable rate mortgage is a, is a mortgage that will adjust at, on a certain periodicity with, depending on I external interest rates. And um, most of these subprime mortgages were um, in, in products that were adjusting very quickly. And what it meant was for a lot of people who bought these mortgages, um, the main way that they were able to pay their mortgages was that 
before the adjustment would occur, which would maybe double or increase their housing payment by, say, 50%, something like that, they would refinance their mortgages. So the ability to refinance a mortgage depended on mortgage prices at least staying stable, but probably going up, because you had to borrow more money to do it, right? So everybody kind of following me there. And what this meant was is that as the, the price of housing started to flatten, actually there's a really interesting analysis of this, that um, it wasn't actually that housing prices dropped, it's that they started to flatten. People couldn't refinance their mortgages. And this meant that all of a sudden a bunch of people went into foreclosure. And of course, once they went into foreclosure, that had a big effect on housing, local housing prices, because those housing prices began to drop. And then, of course, the thing kind of cascaded into a really negative uh, uh, flow downhill. When this happened, um, it created this liquidity crisis that affected all American banks and any other bank who was susceptible to this. And most of those banks were in the developed world. Um, this created this systemic crisis I've shown you in, in 20 countries. Such crises were the main cause of the recession. In this case, it was not contagion um, that caused the crisis, but as I already have argued, um, exposure to these same risky assets. Literally, the collapse of the American MBS CDO market caused the worldwide financial crisis and recession. That would be my main conclusion. So now what does this tell us? I'm gonna give you a little theory. I wanna come back and, you know, some big think here for a few minutes. I think, um, I, I, uh, I think one of the underutilized uh, projects in studying globalization is to not just study the international markets, but to, un to try to understand what the participants are doing. And um, in the case of financial markets, how money is being made in different kinds of ways in these markets. I think um, I'm, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I have a very complicated attitude about what happens, and maybe somebody will ask me a question and I'll explain it. Um, but I think, I think we don't really have a really good understanding of a lot of these things. So even in the markets that people think are the biggest markets where all of the flow and nobody can control it, like, say, um, currency markets, um, it's the case that there aren't a lot of strategies that people are playing in those markets. And um, Donald McKenzie's written this wonderful paper about long-term capital management, which nearly took down the financial system a little while ago, and essentially making the case that everybody knew what they were doing. This wasn't a market that was all a flow market. This was a market where everybody knew what long-term capital management strategies were, and they were, they were either able to bet against them or bet with them, and when the positions that long-term capital management had taken started to become highly correlated, um, the, it was, you know, lights off for the company. And I think we just don't, I think that it's really important as we study these processes to not leave the players out. And so, so let me just give you another, for instance, about something we know nothing about or very little about. And there, there's a book just recently published about this, actually, so we know some, but, but not that seriously, which is all these offshore banking centers. Um, one of the things is that if you go on websites at these offshore banking centers and you look at who's there, that it won't surprise you that it's basically the same banks. And many of them are the banks whose names you know. And so all these offshore banking centers are populated by the same banks. It's not like these are different independent places that this isn't part of one world. Um, and I, again, this is a world that, um, that uh, the people that are in it understand very well, but I think we as social scientists haven't done a really, really great job. And so I think as one, as moving forward, I think it's really important as we study these processes to make sure that we study the players, we study their tactics, we understand what they know and what they don't know and what they're trying to do. And in the case of, um, of financial markets, how they're making money. Um, um, one of the, uh, um, in the sociology of finances, I've already suggested we, we've generally not had a lot of appreciation of that. Um, and we've had lots of talk about instruments and lots of talk about flow, but we haven't had a lot of talk about what, how is it that people make money off of this stuff. And I think if people had really understood what this market was doing, um, I think they might have been a little more scared. And um, I've, uh, I've been recently doing some work looking at the minutes of the Federal Reserve. And um, the Federal Reserve, which meets eight times a year, um, publishes, in, 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 in fact, uh, they publish the, literally the minutes of their meetings but verbatim, and you can identify who's talking in the minutes. And the, and the minutes for 2007 have now been published. And if you go back and see it and read them, what happens is, is you see that they understood that something was going on in the housing markets, but they had no idea about this thing I just explained to you. They, didn't, they, they were completely unaware that all of these markets were linked together and that this 
um, asset-backed commercial paper market was the basic thing that was driving this thing forward. So, you know, these were the smartest guys, right? I mean, you know, and, and finally, when they did understand it, they did the right thing for all of us, I think. I totally think they did the right thing. Um, but, uh, but at the time, they, they, were, they totally didn't have the analysis. And so I think that it's very important to, to um, as we understand these things to go forward, to really get down to this kind of level of the nitty gritty. Um, do banks make up a single field now? Um, I think that's the question I, I think in many ways a lot of banks uh, are. They're each other's reference groups. That's how we sociologists like to think about these things. Um, the banks are participants in many of these markets. Um, some of them are broken out by products where some are dominant and some are less dominant. But clearly they're, they're players in a lot of it. Could this happen again? Um, well, the good news is, is it can happen uh, because this whole market is gone. Um, the, um, uh, one of the things that happened in the United States is that the, the meltdown in this thing was so complete that um, essentially the entire market for mortgages in the United States um, doesn't exist except for Fannie and Freddie, who now are owned by the citizens of the United States, which is the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, at this point, um, the American government owns about four or five trillion dollars worth of the 13 trillion dollars of outstanding mortgages. Um, you didn't hear any presidential candidate talk about that last fall because nobody wants to touch that one. Um, Americans can't buy houses now without Fannie or Freddie and the guarantees that Fannie and Freddie provide. Essentially, the government is running the mortgage market in the United States. This other market that came and went is gone. All the players are gone. It's all burnt out. But obviously, you know, uh, if these banks are watching each other and if they are participating together, whatever they've got cooked up next, you know, we, we should all want to know about that a little bit. And then I just want to make one comment since, I, since I'm out of my time, I think, uh, and uh, just about the, the European crisis. The, um, I think that, um, that one of the most interesting uh, things that's happened in the European crisis as this crisis has gone on is um, the way in which the, um, the, uh, what began as a liquidity crisis in banks um, became a, a, a crisis of uh, government debt. And, um, and I think that, uh, to me, the thing as an outsider that's the most, um, maybe troubling, I would call this troubling too, um, but, the, but the most difficult to understand is why, in the United States when this, when this happened, basically um, all the shareholders were bankrupt, the bondholders took big giant haircuts, and all of the banks were reorganized. And, and you know, at the end of all this, um, the numbers that I've seen suggest that um, the American government's going to lose maybe something like $200 billion in a, in a uh, $15 trillion economy on this. So those losses are not zero, but they're, they're not um, over the top. But what's happened in Europe is that the governments have all kind of taken this on in a way that they've become responsible for the debts and all of this that happened. And, um, and I think that um, as citizens, I, would, I think I would find that to be an interesting thing to try to try to think about. So I'll leave you with that thought, and I thank you for your attention. Okay, we're going to start with two discussants to comment on Professor Flickstein's paper. And consistent with our new series, uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series, both of our discussants will be from outside of sociology. And so we're trying to get some interdisciplinary dialogue here. One of our discussants is Justin Vlasic, who's a postdoc in the Economics of Change Unit here at the Vitz AB. And our other discussant is Michael Zern, who's the director of the Global Governance Unit here at the Vitz AB. And I'll turn it over to them. They're going to speak for about five minutes each. And then we'll let Neil have an opportunity to respond. And then we'll open it to the audience for broader discussion. So th first, thank you very much for a very interesting and illuminating presentation. And as a big aside, Dave mentioned that Reed College is a source for great so uh, sociologists. And I did not go to Reed College like Professor Fliegstein, but I was an honorary member of their ultimate Frisbee team for a season. <laughs> so perhaps there's some hope for me yet. We'll see. Um, so OK, back to the financial crisis and the Great Recession that followed. This was certainly uh, one of the most important economic events, um, at least since the uh, oil shock and stagflation of the 1970s. However, the mechanism that led to this crisis has remained opaque, even to those of us who are economists and have watched the movie The Inside Job. 
but uh, out of the morass of explanations and complex theories that uh, regarding the origins of the crisis, Professor uh, Fligstein has uncovered a remarkably clear message that the most important predictor of whether a country had a domestic financial crisis was simply their exposure to the U.S. housing market. So in comparison, domestic economic conditions and domestic deregulation and even economic ties to the U.S. had relatively small effects. So if this financial crisis was caused by Western banks, all overinvesting in the exact same market, hence creating a systemic risk um, that was realized when the housing bubble burst. This raises the obvious next question as to why were they all chasing the same margins in the US? Now, part of this story might be based on regulation, not necessarily deregulation, as uh, Professor Fligstein showed us was not a significant predictor, but a homogenization of regulation. So if you look at the banking sector of each individual country, um, it is regulated individually to monitor against it taking on an excessive amount of risk. But in the early 2000s, this regulation was homogenized under the Basel II framework, and the European Union in particular prominently pushed for common regulations. And there was one very significant change to the regulations, specifically that risk assessment was outsourced to private and global credit rating agencies. So this created this particular situation um, we we're talking about where on one hand, large banks face very low borrowing costs in the uh, asset-backed commercial papers markets, and on the other hand, they could turn around these and, and invest their borrowed money in markets that were certified by the global credit region agencies as safe um, and had still had high returns. And one of these markets was the US mortgage-backed securities market. And effectively what this did was it created a margin for, at least for a time, seemed like an opportunity for arbitrage. Now many banks in the US, Japan, and the EU took part and invested heavily in these securitized mortgage investments, and for a while they made a lot of money doing so. Um, now of course the homogenization of regularization is just part of the story, perhaps explaining why they were actually allowed by the regulatory institutions to overinvest in this market, it does not explain, however, why banks in the US, uh, the European Union, and Japan were willingly investing in a housing bubble and continued to invest in that bubble even after it became apparent that there were significant risks that this bubble would burst. So perhaps something can be learned here not by asking why they invested, but as looking at the symmetric question as to why some countries did not invest in the US mortgage market. So if this was just easy money, why didn't all banking systems take the advantage and invest in the US market? So particularly in this regard, there's one significant outlier that I'd like to look at, and that's Canada. So if you look at Canada, they have twice the investment um, in the US as a percentage of GDP when compared to Germany. But conspicuous, conspicuously, it is absent from the list of the top 10 MBS investors. And importantly, it did not suffer from a banking crisis or even a severe recession. So perhaps I'll end here with a question, and that is, how did Canadian banks and institutions avoid the trap of overinvesting in the US mortgage market? And what can we learn from their example when considering financial market design for the future? Thank you. Neil, you asked us whether we like the title. And I have to say, I love the title. I mean, this is, just, this is just wonderful. And when I read it, it immediately reminded me to, of this evening, May 25, 1965, when Muhammad Ali, at that time still Cassius Clay, uh, 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 was beating Sonny Listen with a punch that no one saw. And even after all the slow motions were shown, uh, there are only very few people who say, here, here it was, the punch. And it was this invisible punch who put down Sonny Listen at this time, a hard-hitting guy who was seen as the hardest hitter in the world. And this happened in the first minute of the first round by a guy like Cassius Clay, who was 15 kilos uh, easier and, and not a hard hitter, but extremely fast. Well, I mean, Sonny Listen never recovered from this defeat. Uh, and, and had, stopped, uh, had to stop his career, and Muhammad Ali started with 
a victory which was associated with black Muslims, corruption, mafia, and all that because nobody saw the hit. And 50, <laughs> and 50 years later, Muhammad Ali was one of, is one of the greatest Americans uh, of the 20th century. But, but I think here the parallel stops in a way <laughs> uh, because, because um, well, capitalism recovered from this defeat, uh, at least to some extent, and it's still there, as opposed to Sonny Listen at this time. And I do have my doubts whether those investment bankers who created those mortgage-backed uh, securities will be heroes of American history 50 <laughs> years from now. So in, in that sense, I mean, there are limits to this, to this parallel. But, but that was my, my, my association in the first, the first moment. Thank you for this really very uh, imaginative presentation and paper. Um, and essentially, I do not have a lot to criticize. I mean, the paper, when I read it, and he, he, he passed on the paper to us in the beginning, did something that rarely happens to someone. You read it, and after the paper, you are convinced. The yeah. guy is right. The guy is right. Those countries where the banks uh, were highly involved in this business were those who, were, uh, who essentially uh, experienced a banking crisis. Uh, in that sense, there's, of course, agreement. But I mean, I was assigned the role of the political scientist here by, by uh, David. And, and as such, of course, I have to struggle a little bit with your statement that deregulation did not play of course, as political scientist, I have to maintain the idea that if there would have been a better regulation, there would have been not this kind of financial crisis. And I will try to do it. I will try to do it. And, and I will do it essentially by, by picking up um, a, a question that you, that you put forward in your presentation at the end and asking this thing that we have to understand the logic of the underlying market participants in order to account for those kind events. And, and I want to essentially ask this question, why is it that those banks bite those mortgage-based securities in spite of the fact that it was crap? Uh, and, and, and I had uh, the possibility at one point to I think it was in 2008 or something like this, to, to ask the chairman of the Deutsche Bank uh, about, about this question. And I had even the possibility to push him a little bit. And after, um, after some time, um, he, he answered, no, no, we were not stupid. Most bankers knew that this market will break down at a certain point. But everyone wanted to earn as much money possible before the breakdown. We had no other chance than to do it. And then, of course, the question arises, why do they believe that there is no other chance that they have even to do it? And there I can aside again argument, but now publicly and very loudly to the German public, uh, saying uh, we need to increase the return to our shareholders in order to make our shares much more expensive. If we don't do this, an American bank will buy us. So obviously, there was a sort of a sense on the side of the actors uh, that the structure has, is so that they have to be greedy. There's a structurally grounded greediness. And, and uh, this is at least the case if both of these statements are true. Uh, in this sense, at least one plausible answer could be, of course, that the overall financial regulation, maybe not the credit regulation per country that you talk about, but that the overall financial deregulation plays an important role for this story. In, in that sense, I'm back with the political scientist idea of regulation may be a, a, a good thing. And, and of course, I mean, the whole thing seems to me, and that leads just to one general comment about, about the paper, that you have, it seems to me, some uh, variables here in order to explain variants which have so little variance in themselves in the developed world. And of course, deregulation, market uh, financial deregulation is one of those things. All the countries deregulated, there's still variance, but this variance does not explain anymore a lot. But nevertheless, it's an enabling condition. And the same may be true for the kind of, of globalization or the trade globalization in terms of trade uh, interdependence, I think your second hypothesis that you reject. Here also, the 10 countries that you point to, there are differences in the uh, trade uh, decree between them, but nevertheless, you can see it as a sort of a 
of an enabling background condition. And in that sense, my only question essentially would be whether it is not necessary essentially to point to this enabling background conditions when you display your model, when you develop your model. And part of this question is sort of a, how shall I put it off? of uh, the responsibility of the intellectual. That, of course, if policymakers read your papers, then they learn, well, we just have to prohibit it, this instrument and then everything is fine. But of course, they have to learn that this kind of interactions, this structurally based greediness uh, took place in a certain context and this context is the stuff that needs to be uh, regulated. So in, in this sense, it is essentially a plea for, a, for an extension of your argument. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks for those comments. Yeah, I, um, let me start with the second one. I'll move to the first one. I'll go backwards. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, think you're, I think you're right about that. And actually, I think the two comments come together a little bit. I, I think that um, clearly um, the, uh, the international regulation uh, has converged in many ways. Um, the Basel Accords um, uh, are, are the main framework for this. Um, I hadn't realized that um, uh, that the EU had gone ahead and, and given the um, American credit rating agencies carte blanche. This is another one of those stories, I'll just, just go off on one little tangent here, um, that um, why were there only uh, three credit rating agencies? And in the United States in the 1970s when they, when they started this uh, business, um, they wanted to have there be these public, these credit rating agencies. And so um, by an act of Congress, they created a category which I'm now repressing on um, it, it's, it's one of those bureaucratic acronyms that, that is meaningless unless you remember it. And, um, and essentially, um, you had to be registered with the government to have this status. And, um, and so obviously that, um, that worked uh, for a long time in the United States in bond rating. And um, so these, these bond raters who were previously just private businesses really became sort of quasi-governmental organizations and that they then get incorporated into the global regulatory system, you know, essentially by by fiat or something like that, or agreement, collective agreement is, is uh, I, I know that part of the story, and so um, I, think that's, I think that's probably you're right, and both of you are right in that, in that sense. Um, the Canadians managed to avoid this um, because of their banking system has a very different regulatory structure, and, and in that case, the national regulations did make a difference, and they weren't able to be involved um, in this American market. And they essentially avoided it because that, of regulatory reasons, and as a result, they, they didn't suffer from it. And, um, um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the simple um, version of that. Um, there was one other point I wanted to make. Um, it eludes me now. I'll come back if I can't remember it. Go ahead. But thank you. So we'll take some questions from the floor. We do have a microphone up here in the front, if possible, but probably not necessary. Um, sure, we'll start right here. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Give me a second. Okay, I'll get you. Um, I already. Sorry, I called on him. I'm sorry. You can go second. I promise. Okay. All right. Go. No. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I messed up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I found your story very plausible, but I also like your title, the sucker. But I wonder who are the suckers, and I believe you might need to disaggregate uh, a little bit the banking world. There are a few players which are very important, and there are rather few who actually make the game. And then others come later on. And that makes quite a difference because those who make the game came out, most of them, quite well. Deutsche Bank, Morgan, and so on, the, uh, Goldman Sachs especially. While others coming in later, they were the suckers. And uh, they came in later because of uh, deregulation. Uh, very important in Germany, the deregulation of the real estate banks. They were very heavily regulated and then about 10 years ago or even less they got deregulated and then could go, could go to Ireland, 
Iceland and so on, and then start the game into the US. And those coming late are the ones who are usually not so good at playing it. And the first German bank that went under, IKB, uh, they were confronted by Goldman Sachs people, uh, big documents, and they had one, two lawyers looking at it within an hour, not really understanding English, and then they signed it. So I think that has to be uh, distinguished, and Kindleberger told us about that, these kind of waves, you know, that they try, the big players try to ride the waves, and others hop on and are not really able to ride the waves. So I think here you might have to differentiate a little bit. The other point is uh, concerning contagion. I, I believe when one looks closer at individual cases, one sees quite differences. So for example, Spain. The Spanish banks were not really involved in it, and Spain got into the crisis because of its own conditions uh, there. England got into the crisis so heavily also because, in addition of its own uh, conditions. In Germany, uh, the export industries uh, in Baden-Württemberg, they got into the crisis for different reasons very shortly. But here is a very interesting, again, the point of deregulation. There's one sector in Germany which is not really deregulated, and that's the Sparkassen, and which are extremely important for giving money to the small and medium enterprises, and they were not in the game. And so they were not part of the contagion effect. I take all of your points. Um, the, um, yeah, I think, I think that's true that, um, and, and clearly, um, if you looked at my line, that go, you know, that line that goes to 1.2 trillion, um, they were looking for those customers. Um, let, me, um, let me answer that, though, in a slightly different way, and I think this is the point I was trying to remember a minute ago, um, which is that um, there is a lot of evidence that the housing bubble itself is, to some degree, being driven by the desire of people like Goldman Sachs to sell these bonds. And, and you get hints of this in the literature, just hints of this in the literature. But let me, let me see if I can, I can construct what, it's really a hard argument to prove, totally a hard argument to prove. But, um, but what happened was is that because they could sell these instruments um, uh, and, there were, um, and the market for it was so huge, um, they were continuously innovating, if you want to use that word, on these CDOs, and they created products that were called CDO CDOs, and then there were CDOs C of the CDO CDOs. And one of the reasons those products sold so much is that there was just like un almost an unlimited demand for them. And, um, and there's e a little bit of evidence that says that what that did is it meant that the traders in these big companies would go to their um, uh, securitizers and the originators and say, give us more of this stuff, particularly the more risky stuff, because we can package it and make more money off of it. And, um, and uh, there's um, enough of that kind of uh, anecdotal evidence that says that, that um, at, and particularly towards the end where these products are being shoved out to any, the, the last suckers in the game or something like that, are being told, triple-A stuff, it's making 7%, you can make 3% some other way, it's free money, you want to do this. And it, was, and it was sort of driving it, it was driving them. And one of the things that, that um, some of you may wonder is why would anybody give a loan to somebody who didn't have any credit? Um, probably in German society that would happen very often. And the answer to that question is, is, is that those mortgages were actually more valuable for the securitization. So that, that if you, um, if you put a mortgage that somebody had very little credit history, you could charge them more fees and an extra percentage point for the interest and then package it and it would, you know, be a, and then with the whole process of creating AAA rated mortgage bonds, it would all kind of come out and you could make more money off of it. And so there is evidence that it wasn't just that the, the traders were, were out there trying to take advantage of people, but there was this kind of exuberance that was driving the whole thing. Okay, in the back with the microphone. Also, um, Mr. Schäuble said recently, or a couple of weeks ago, that the big mistake in Germany was that the investment banking and the um, saving banking were confused. And this was a big mistake. They should have divided, uh, as they used to have it all the years, they should not have um, fused these things, but kept them separate as always. And now they are doing this, um, 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 also the, this development, they try to diff, uh, also 
wie heißt das, Refuse, nee, Diffuse, these banks again, also investment banking is a different thing and um, a saving bank is also another thing. And one more thing, my good friend lost 150 or 170 German, uh, no, Euros if in Goldman Sachs. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think if I was, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the United States, there's, um, there, there's sort of two discussions going on now, believe it or not, even in the United States. Um, I, I think that um, separating these businesses is probably the right strategy. I mean, I, I'm a, my own, I know this makes me like, uh, most of the time makes me on the, such a left fringe in the United States, I might as well be, you know, wherever. And, but, um, but going back to some version of uh, what we had was something called the Glass-Steagall Act, where you separate these businesses, I, th I think there's a lot of sense in that. And, um, and there's actually discussion going on now in the United States um, around uh, essentially these trader activities and these investment banking activities re you know, uh, uh, putting them behind a wall. And then the more utility functions of banks, um, like for small savers and, and, and even for mortgages, um, and, uh, um, and then, you know, investing in small, medium-sized enterprises, keeping those in a separate kind of way where they're highly regulated. And I, I mean, my own, you know, I, I, I think had something like that been in place, I mean, there are different ways that such regulation could, could work. I think if something like that had been in place, it would have prevented some of this um, in some of these countries. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm in sympathy with your comment. Okay, Rude, did you have a question? Yeah, you can. Hi, Ruth Koopmans from the Migration and uh, Integration Unit here at the WZB. Uh, several times during your talk, which I found super interesting, uh, you opposed an explanation in terms of contagion to your explanation in terms of exposure to risk and I didn't quite get that contradiction because doesn't contagion in this case operate through exposure to risk? Isn't the risk uh, causing the contagion? I mean, you know, contagion is, you know, something that spreads through contact and no diffusion theory that I know of doesn't claim that diffusion occurs through social networks, through channels of contact. You've emphasized the channel of contact here, but within these contact networks, we have contagion occurring, as far as I can see. So maybe you can explain why you see an opposition there. Thank you for catching me. Uh, I, uh, um, yeah, I was, um, this is um, one of those things that I struggle with a lot. So let me, let me, let me um, and, I, and it was actually in, in your question too a little bit, and I, I didn't answer it. Um, the, um, you know, in, in, the, in the financial literature about, about these crises that occur on a worldwide basis, um, usually the, the, the contagion um, argument isn't, uh, uh, is used in a specific kind of way, and usually the way it gets used is that um, um, in the economics discipline, uh, these things are always rational, even though they're terrible events, they're always rational. And they're rational in two ways. One is that, um, uh, uh, the financial actors who are looking at uncertainties um, are thinking the uncertainties in some places are larger than another. So it's the financial actors making the decision to move the capital. That's one story. And then the other story um, is the one um, that, uh, that somehow the underlying conditions in a particular country um, are mimicking the conditions in other countries and, and therefore um, those conditions as so, for example, in the case of the housing bubble in Spain, the housing bubble in Spain was being driven also by uh, loans that were being made for projects that didn't make any economic sense. And, and once that became apparent, um, the, you know, people started to default and the thing kind of went down. And, um, and I think what I'm trying to distinguish from that is um, the idea that, in fact, what's, what was going on here is that these banks weren't the um, uh, outs, weren't, uh, through a one or two step process being affected by um, this, but were in fact um, part and parcel of this market, this world market which had come to exist, that all of these banks were playing this game um, and that they all knew each other and they were all making money this way and there was you know, 25 or 30 of them and they bought $1.2 trillion worth of American mortgage backed securities in a very short period of time. And, um, and I see that as um, not incorporated in the traditional ways in which people have deployed those arguments, so like in the Asian financial crisis, to try to understand why different countries were affected in that crisis. 
and um, uh, which some of which turn on the conditions uh, in the country, some of which turn on financial investors, you know, flight to safety because they're sitting there and the, the so-called hot money moves or something. And that's not what this was at all. This was really a case where the banks were in, uh, emulating. It was, this is like one of those things, um, in, in, my, in my view about globalization, what globalization, a, a globalized market really is, is when a market operates across national borders with players who know each other under a set of rules that they all kind of understand. And this was a globalized market, a real globalized market, not a, not a kind of thing about trade or flows or exports or people not being aware of each other. This was, a, this was just like a national market um, in that sense. And, and, that, and in that way, this, this was a little bit different. I, that, that was my intention. Okay, Dorothea. Uh, regarding the credit rating agencies, you touched them only a little bit, and I would like to come back to what Michael said was maybe there is some regulatory failure because it seems that the, the rating agencies, they made the game possible because of the, the AAA ratings. Uh, and of course, looking back at this, there was so much correlation in these papers that you wonder why they received the credit, a AAA rating. Now, there is a simple explanation, and that is that uh, there was a conflict of interest because these uh, these agencies worked for the banks that were issuing the CBOs and not for the customers buying them. So uh, maybe some more regulation in that respect would have helped and I, d I think you did not have that in your story and it was not part of the regulation variable uh, that you had. So that uh, I, um, uh, I agree with that. Uh, let, me, let me say just a couple things about it. Um, there's, there's, it's even worse than you think, uh, which is that um, there is a lot of evidence that, that if for every one of these bonds that was issued, you needed to have two raters. And this was regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And um, essentially, the, there's lots of evidence that the banks played the, the, um, the, reg the agencies off against each other. And this has been something which, at this point, none of the uh, Dodd-Frank bill really does anything about, and I, and I don't know what about, maybe you, have, you can tell me about what's happening in the international arena, whether people still believe these guys. But um, this is kind of, I think, one of those things that's a big problem, that where there's only so few of these. The government has tried to get other people to come in and become part of this, um, to, to create more um, of, of, the, of the ratings agencies. But um, let me say one thing in their defense, which, um, which is um, one of these things which uh, um, is, is hard to, um, uh, I guess I don't want to defend them too far, but let me say one defense thing, uh, thing in the defense. The way these models worked is actually pretty straightforward, the way crediting agencies make these ratings. And, the, and, and um, what they have is they have actual mortgage data um, on individuals, and they know whether or not individuals have, have defaulted on their mortgages. And they have historical data on every mortgage in the country. And they, of course, they don't run regressions on every mortgage in the country. They sample them. But, but you know, you can, you know, you don't have to get, you know, get 100,000 mortgages. That's a lot of, in a, you know, over 20 years. And what comes out of these analyses is they, they create a prediction equation. And the two most uh, important variables in the prediction equation were a person's credit score, which in the United States is very important. I don't know if they have that. Yeah, that you have credit scores. Okay. And, um, and then the housing price appreciation in the zip code. And, um, and what happened was, as the 90s turned into the aughts, even if you went back into 20 years worth of data, all you've had is rising housing prices, right? And what's going on in the, these equations is the equations are just mimicking the reality out there, which is that this is a weird kind of, if I use a word some of you sociologists recognize, performativity, right? That the, that the credit agencies are just giving these ratings because it looks like as these markets are, you know, there's this really strong relationship, and if somebody's in trouble, they just sell their house, you know, because they, they can. And when they talk about doing stress tests on these things, nobody ever thought that, you know, mortgage, that housing prices in these areas would fall 50%. But if you think that there's a positive relationship between housing prices going up and whether or not you default and you, in a regression analysis, and you, you think that something could have a negative sign, it would fall 50%, then you would think there would be a lot of defaults. So I don't even know that you could have written that, you could have even had you, you know, you could have imagined a scenario under which, and there were 
conversations about this, that that's what people were doing. But nobody really believed that was going to happen, that they were going to see. So, um, so I'm not completely, I'm not giving them off the hook, but I am telling you that's how they arrived at those. And so as the bubble kept going, everything looked really hunky-dory, you know. It just looked like everything was, you know, great, you know. But that's what I'm just, you know, it's an interesting point. But you're right, you are right, but I'm just giving you that. Okay, in the back there, go ahead. Yeah. There was one, um, one reason for the crisis which you didn't mention, that sociological reason, it was inequality. You had, uh, why did all these people sign the mortgage contracts? Because they wanted to keep up their standard of living. And at that moment, they, where they uh, went in, into poverty, they couldn't pay the mortgages back and the crisis, crisis broke out. Yeah, there's, there's, this, is one of the, um, this is one of the other great questions that um, has, um, so far, from what I can tell in the literature, sort of eluded actual pinning down. And, and let me explain what I mean by that, which is that who were these people taking these loans? And it's very clear that there was predatory lending going on, predatory in the sense that people were being um, sold things that they shouldn't have been sold, and that the people who were selling them to them knew that, and there are many lawsuits ongoing in the United States about this, and, and people have been winning money. Um, but there were, there, were, there, were, there were two other kind of people that were caught up, in, and it doesn't completely undermine your inequality story. Um, one was, is that if we look in where the um, uh, housing price appreciations were the greatest, what this was doing is it was forcing middle class people, so it wasn't just lower, it wasn't just the, the kind of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the NPR story is the, is the church lady in, in Cleveland who, who somebody in her congregation got her to sell her house and she lost her house. That's the, that's the National Public Radio, that's the American version of, of this thing. But what's going on is that a huge proportion of people got, got priced out of the market. And so they had to move farther and farther away. And, and uh, where I live in the Bay Area, this is what happened. In the, and um, so, nobody could, so the, the, nobody could afford to live in San Francisco um, many people couldn't afford to live in the East Bay where I live, and so they moved um, as far as 50 or 75 miles away where people were building these housing developments, and of course they could barely afford those houses either. So a lot of middle class people were caught in this as well, and they had the same exact problem. And then there is a third category, which is um, people who are speculating. And um, there was, as this, um, they were also the ones who didn't get the message that this was a bubble and it was about to end, that a lot of people bought houses that they didn't live in and thought they were going to flip in 12 months. And so a lot of these mortgages were for people who were trying to make the minimum amount of payments they could, knowing that 12 months later they would try to sell the house. So nobody quite knows what the breakdown is, like a third, a third, and a third, you know, third people who are really you know, we shouldn't have done anything. And then a third of the people who got driven out of markets and a third were speculation. But those are the kind of numbers that people throw around. But, but what you're saying is right. At least two-thirds of those are being driven by inequality. Here in the front. Yeah, thank you very much. Just in passing, you uh, mentioned that uh, the investment chances for Western capitalism, I think that's how you said it, were not that good over the last 20, 30 years. Would it be worthwhile to develop this argument further in order to add uh, another, I mean, explanatory dimension to the argument? And why was not, why were there not better and perhaps less, I mean, risky uh, opportunities available so that so many banks went into this uh, market, particularly if Michael Cern is right that they, I mean, quoting this boss, Deutsche Bank, that they knew it would be breaking down sometime. Going into this direction, is there too much financial resources around looking for uh, investment? Or why are there not more, I mean, uh, less risky, positive uh, development? This might relate to other uh, theories of economic ups and downs, like Schumpeterian ones, or so on. Yeah, um, I think uh, that, uh, I mean, the, the one thing you said that I, I, I totally agree with is there's a lot of money floating around the world that doesn't have anywhere to go. 
and um, and so there is a lot of money looking for for opportunities and um, and that this one seemed like at the time a really sure bet because American banks were making a lot of money off of it. I, I think it's easy in retrospect to go back and say, well, you know, who knows why, why were these guys, you know, so easy to, to be gullible? But people were making a lot of money off of this. So, but I do think this problem of you know it's kind of an endemic problem of capitalism. You know, the the um, uh, that that uh, you know the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is um, something that I don't think has been repealed. And um, and I think that uh, um, that in in this case, a lot of these financial institutions didn't didn't have things that um, they thought were good investments. I think in the case of European banks, because of the relative slow economic growth in Europe, um, a lot of I mean, it, I'm sure your banker would tell you this, and maybe it wouldn't be something he'd want to say in public, but he would tell you that investing in Germany and German um, um, business at this point, because the consumer markets are sort of fixed and they're not growing. Um, it makes way more sense if you're going to make investment to try to find something that's going to give you higher rates of return. And, um, and whether that's, you know, that, and I think that's why 25 or 30 years ago, political economists thought, well, that's why all this money is going to flood into the developing world, because that's where the high rates are. It's going to be high risk, but that's where the high opportunities are. So invest in Brazil if you can, invest in China, invest in, even, right? and we all know that didn't turn out very well for most of them either. Um, but I think that's what they were. That's what they were doing. And so there is a kind of irony at this point. I think that there's a lot of capital, but but it's um, it's it's dead and floating in many ways. And in the United States, I think the problem is extreme because of the the way larger extremes of, of wealth and income inequality that we have. And so um, there's this. Uh, uh, it's it's you know the the one percent controls so much of national income and national wealth that's kind of crazy like why do people need more but they but obviously they're politically organized to hold on to it and they they think they do and so but I think these opportunities you know I think this one just looked like a really good one and people were making money off of it and I think that's why they did it. I think it's kind of that simple but I think that you're right that um, finding other opportunities um, as as we move into the next 20 or 30 years it's going to be a big problem for um, all these financial institutions and particularly to the degree that many people have their money invested in pension funds which are also looking for returns as people are trying to retire so big crisis okay michael hutter has the next question I'm always interested in the social construction of value and the construction of that kind of value in those products is certainly fascinating. And it's also fascinating because we're not just looking at some sort of failure, we're looking at a development that hasn't happened before in the world of the economy or finance. So we are entering new territory. And um, and, and what you did in this fascinating evening, you gave some fragments of the story. Um, there are first those uh, traders that go to the security people and say, package more, package more, we can sell it all. And then there are those foreign banks which are driven by their own shareholders and by the fear of hostile takeover <laughs> that they have to go for the highest profit op opportunity, otherwise they couldn't justify it. And then you have those rating agencies who are working for the, for the banks who are actually paying them, but they're being played against each other. And finally, uh, they're almost like the white knight. Uh, there's the Federal Reserve, which first doesn't really know what's going on, but then at the decisive point knows what to do. Just flood it, and then you get out of it. And, and I, I do agree, it, it, it happened, and I think it really uh, uh, t turned over our idea of central bank policy. If you hear central bankers talk today, they talk totally different than from what they talked about 10 years ago. Then there were a fortress. Now there are flooding agency. Now, uh, my question really is, my question is, what does your theory of fields contribute to understanding that story? Uh, is this all one field? Or do, are you saying the banks make up a field? And the, the Federal uh, Reserves are other actors, and the single traders within Goldman Sachs are another kind of field? Is there an interaction of fields? That's what I'd be interested in. Okay, that one will take me 15 minutes, I can tell you. Um, but uh, uh, 
let me let me give my one of the the reasons uh, as this, as this all started to happen um like i think many people i was watching it in horror and uh um and um and it just struck me as so imponderable what happened um and um and the farther i got into it the more i realized that it struck the people who were involved uh, who should have known something is also imponderable now the reason bernanke you know bernanke's uh, was famous i think everybody knows this is that that his academic work was on the depression and and what when he the one thing he wrote about the depression is that he, he had an argument that when the american banking system collapsed it really collapsed and there were no banks left in the united states and and his argument was is that's one of the reasons the depression lasted so long in the United States is that there was literally no banks. And um, I think there was, a, he had an aha moment, um, and we're going to find out actually in 2008, in 2014, in January, when they released the minutes of these meetings, when he had that moment exactly. When he, when he got up in front of those guys and said, you know what? <laughs> We, this is this is this is really reminding me of something, and um, and uh, um, and it will be interesting to see that. But um, coming back to your Fields point, um, I think the thing that they missed, and I think the thing that field theory can do, which I'm only like kind of tapping around the edges of, and I agree with that, is that um, this was an interconnected set of fields of which no one really understood it. Nobody understood all of the things that you were talking about. And the relationships between these fields, now we can talk about it because we can go back and reconstruct it. And we're having like a massive, uh, you know, kind of reconstruction of the crime sort of, you know. And uh, so that's the first part of the story, I think, is to figure that out. But I, think it's, but I think there are multiple fields here and they are interpenetrating with each other and they are doing different things and different actors are in different places where um, they're willing to bracket off something that's coming in as an input to them and the people that they're paying attention to and and their field and then of course it's affecting something else that's over here and so i i see this as as a um as a, a multiple kind of set of fields and so um in field analysis i think you try to simplify things because you just focus on the one which is the market for these securities but um which which is different than the housing market but it but the connections between those fields are are definitely um the focus of the larger sets of things i've been doing Okay, we have time for one more question. If the audience doesn't have one, I'll ask it. Okay, uh, so um, so I, th I really like Michael's question and it got me thinking, so it's a, a multi-pronged question given we have an interdisciplinary mission for this lecture series. You know, is the, the presentation today, the project, the argument you're making distinctly sociological? If so, how? And if not, should it or could it be? <laughs> I guess it depends on what you mean by sociology. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So make a claim. Uh, make a, um, oh yeah, I don't think anybody. I, I don't think any. You can't understand this if you're not a sociologist. And and even the economists that are trying to understand it are becoming sociologists because they don't have any choice. Because that's the only way it makes any sense. Because because you've got to understand the, the logics and rationalities of the actors. And if you don't understand what the actors are doing, and that you you can't do that from a model. Um, uh, the, I will say that with one caveat. Uh, when, when the savings and loan crisis happened, there was a, there was a huge amount of corruption, and um, about 2,500 bankers went to jail, and of course, right now, as all of you may know, zero have gone to jail. But um, George Akerlof, who's an economist who won the Nobel Prize, and not well liked by most economists because he's always been sort of heterodox, um, wrote a paper about looting and the conditions under which it makes sense for, for bankers to loot. But the problem of a paper like that is, is that, you know, I mean, uh, you know, once you, you can make a model for anything, right? And that's part of the problem is, is that if you, if you start with a formal model, then, you know, you can end up in, you know, and you know what happened, then you just, it's just getting the equations right. And um, so I, I think, um, so I think, I think that, um, I think that this, you know, that, that this is about that. It's about, it's about the cultural construction of these things. It's about, you know, that bankers and different people in different parts of these organizations feel different things or know different things. And I, you didn't mention the, this thing about, um, you know, when, you, when, when I explained to you how they got those ratings, um, you, that's not crazy. If somebody sat down with you and said, well, this is how we run those models and this is what we've got and let me show you the numbers, you'd be sitting there going, hmm, well, I, Okay, 
Yeah, I, that's not, and that's a sociology problem inherently, right? About um, about that, and so so I think I think it's all sociology, but that's. <laughs> But I'm an imperialist, so I go the other way. <laughs> okay, uh, two quick announcements. Uh, first of all, tomorrow there will be a book workshop uh, featuring James Cook from Oxford University Press and Neil discussing strategies for book publishing, and that will occur next door at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And more importantly, we're having a reception right now, so please join us outside the A300. See you then.